All right. Well, let's try to transition. Now, finally, is there a positive case for Christianity? The good news, yes. There's lots of good reasons to think that Christianity is true. And we will see those this week. But of course, like I said, we need to begin with this notion of truth. So what I want to do is I'm going to write some names on the board, and you tell me what they all have in common. La 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 la. Okay. <laughs> so, what do they all have in common? <laughs> Innovators. No. What do they have in common? Yes, but no. They all critique modernism. No, because some of those people are before modernism. At least one on this list. I could add more. They all what? Uh, well, that's ho hopefully true of all of us, but uh, certainly that would be true of them, too. Okay, let me put it this way. They all did the same job at one point in their careers. No? They changed the game. That wasn't their job, was to change the game. What was their, what was their job? They got paid to do this. They were professors. Ah. Now, not only were they professors, but they were scholar activists. They were innovators. You're right on that. Um, these were people who were scholars, but they understood something that is absolutely crucial for us to understand as we begin to build a positive case for Christianity. And this is the door that we're going to get into this, is I want to ask you, why ought we care about postmodernism? And here's the first answer. Because ideas matter. These guys got it. Think about it. Think, pick any of these guys. Charles Darwin, he got it. Ideas matter. And we are living in the shadow of the ideas that he propagated. Uh, who's Betty Friedan? Good. The Feminine Mystique was the book. Founder of? Now. National Organization of Women. Um, who's Timothy Leary? Yes, this is the drug guy. Taught at Harvard and also experimented on LSD and other things. Professor. But they understood that ideas matter. And this is one reason why we ought to care about postmodernism. Let me give you another reason why we ought to care about postmodernism. And this would be what I will just call the analogy actually with evolution. When did the origin of species come out? What year? Here, lots of mumbling. 1859. <laughs> 1859, Origin of Species comes out. <clears throat> How was the Christian community prepared to respond to that? The answer is not very well. We had some sophisticated responses, but by and large, we were not in a position to respond to the threat of evolution. Fast forward 100 years, evolution is taught as fact in the university. I know, I work with professors, Christian and non Christian alike. It is taught in the university as fact. And as we talked about earlier last week, any time that you push back on that, you're usually labeled as uh, religious or dogmatic or ignorant or something like that. Even though I, now I think the state of the evidence, scientifically as well as philosophically and otherwise, uh, would, would show that we ought to be a little wary of something like evolution. Well, we've lost that one. We, in, in a large way, we've kind of lost it. Now, yes, we're having some pretty significant pushback. A new book just came out this summer by Stephen Meyer called Darwin's Doubt that is that. Uh, the preview number seven on the New York Times list this week. So there's pushback. And there's, uh, there's Thomas Nagel, I talked about that last week, the guy that wrote this book, Ta Mind and Cosmos, pushback by atheists. But you should see the pushback that they're getting from the establishment. You know, uh, Thomas Nagel, this atheistic philosopher who argues against evolution, is labeled a heretic by the establishment in the academy. And so there's an article in the New, York, uh, New Yorker about uh, basically trying to burn him at the stake, again, for denying Darwinism. And here's the analogy. If we don't give a credible response to postmodernism, we will find ourselves again without a voice on the key issues 
of the day. Now the good news is, I believe we've responded pretty good to postmodernism. And I even think we can perhaps envision the day, maybe we're even there where we've moved on. And I'll explain a little bit more on that maybe as we go. But 10 years ago, this was like everybody's talking about the emergent church and what about postmodernism? And it seemed like I was speaking everywhere on that. Um, I think less so today. But we still need to be mindful of this because popularly, uh, postmodernism sort of rules the day in conversations. You know, you might not know you're postmodern. I'm not saying you, but you in the plural sense, our culture. You might not know it, but a lot of us have just sort of imbibed in this mood or in this mindset. And so we're very foggy in our thinking. Um, and that's why we need to engage it. Third reason why we ought to care. Christians, God's call for us as Christians to understand the times. Romans 13, 11, Paul says, understanding the present time. 2 Corinthians 10.5, Paul again, we demolish arguments and every pretension or false idea that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 10.5. 2 Timothy 1.14, Paul says, uh, guard the good deposit, which is the gospel, Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. And guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in you. Uh, let's see, so has anybody uh, done a stint or done ministry over in Europe, for example? I know a lot of you have done stints. Uh, what, is, what is it like sharing the gospel in Europe, for those of you who have been there? Hard. Brick wall. Kind of like drilling in cement sometimes. Why? Any thoughts? What kind of cultural mindset does Europe find itself in, by and large? Post-Christian, post-modern, yeah. Yeah, and, and so if you want a picture of what engaging the gospel could be like in a post-modern context, well, it would be Europe today. And I don't think for whatever, well, we, we haven't arrived there in America, I don't think we will, but, but by and large, Europe is largely postmodern, and, and th this is what we need to do. Remember how we talked about on the first day we need to be diagnosticians of our culture? Well, these are the reasons why, so that we can, so the gospel will gain a hearing, we will prepare the soil, and so on. The last thing I guess I want to say is that our culture is intellectually and morally confused. I've probably said this in a whole host of different ways, but, but we are morally confused and conceptually illiterate when it comes to thinking about things that matter most. And what that means, what that entails, in the postmodern mindset that we found ourselves in is that we're now also existentially bankrupt. So conceptually illiterate, morally confused, and in that milieu, we become existentially bankrupt. And postmodernism only, only contributes to this confusion and bankruptcy by offering despair instead of hope. Uh, it offers confusion instead of clarity. It offers skepticism instead of a humble confidence. It offers a subjective God instead of a loving and pursuing God of Christianity. Okay? This is why we ought to care. So the question, what is postmodernism? And there's two ways to define it. Uh, here they are. Historically and philosophically. So we'll try. What's interesting about postmodernism, it's notoriously difficult to define, actually. And so I, I will offer you two ways of defining it, and um, you know, it'll, it'll just help you sort of begin to understand it. The, the historical way is this postmodernism is that movement, you ready, that replaces modernism. <laughs> so that's, I mean, that's it. It's what comes after modernism. So, of course, the question is, what's modernism? Well, the modern era began with Descartes, a guy named, French guy named Descartes. He lived from 1596 to 1650. And the modern era went to a bunch of other French guys who lived in the 1960s. Um, and that would be your modern era. And then, so, you know, does anything good come? I'm not going to say that. Um, <laughs> Okay, so that'd be one way to define it historically. I think probably the philosophical definition is maybe more helpful, and here's what that is. Postmodernism is primarily a reinterpretation of what knowledge is, 
and what counts as knowledge. So postmodernism is primarily a reinterpretation of what knowledge is and what counts as knowledge. So more broadly, I would say something like this. It's, it's, a re, uh, it's, it's a form of cultural relativism and skepticism about a whole host of things. Values, meaning, truth, knowledge, the self, and so on. I can, uh, I'll repeat that if you want. Real, it's, so it's a form of cultural relativism and skepticism about reality, about truth, about values, about knowledge, about meaning, and the self. I want to um, give you a history of ideas in five minutes by focusing on one of the so-called problems that we have been thinking about as long as we've been thinking. So we introduced you to the problem of evil last semester. Well, there's all these so-called problems of philosophy that people think about all the time. There's the mind-body problem, and that asks the question, how do we make sense of you know, our mental properties if we're just brains? It's called the mind-body problem. You've heard the problem of evil. Um, the problem I want to focus on is what's called the problem of the subject-object dichotomy, or let's just call it the subject-object dichotomy. Now, it might sound confusing, but it's really not. Is all it is. The subject-object dichotomy is this. It asks this question. How do we, as knowing subjects, have knowledge about an objective world? That's all it is. How do we, as knowing subjects, have knowledge of an objective world? That's called the subject-object dichotomy. Let me give you the answer. There's basically been three answers through the history of ideas on this question. How do we, as knowing subjects, have knowledge of the objective world? Okay? The first answer, this is the pre-modern answer. The pre-modern answer said this. They said, God exists. And because God exists, as the normative principle, we can know things about the world around us. So, you know, we do have reason, but reason serves God, revelation. Reason serves revelation. So what would be the dates? This would be everything up until the modern era. So this would include the Reformation. This would include the Middle Ages. And so, um, so for example, the medievals held to what's called a pre-formation theory. And the medievals said, we can know God, and we can know the world that he's created because God has preformed us in such a way as to understand and to perceive it. So this view, the pre-modern view, said there's a God's eye point of view. And because God created the world, we can know the world around us. If you want a motto for this, it would be the Anselmian motto, which I put up on the screen there. Anselm said, if you read in the Proslogion, uh, he says, I believe in order to understand. So notice the order of knowledge there. I believe, God, what you revealed to me, in order to understand. Another Anselmian quote is, faith seeking understanding. So we believe in order to understand. Okay, so this is the first sort of pre-modern way. Think of even Calvin, all the way up to Calvin. He lived 1509, 1564, still just at the end of the pre-modern period. Well, if you read Calvin's Institutes for Christian Religion, the very first couple chapters, he says that we can only know ourselves by knowing God first, and vice versa. We can only understand God by knowing ourselves. But we can only know ourselves by first knowing God. That's a very pre-modern way of thinking about things. Okay? So that's, there we go, pre-moderns. Okay. Then we arrive at the modern era. The modern era asks the same question. How do we as knowing subjects have knowledge of the external world? world? But here the answer is kind of interesting. Look what happens. God is dethroned and reason is moved up to the top as the normative principle. So here, by the way, just to go back here, you've got, so for example, Alexander of Clement. He says that Philosophy is a handmaiden of the queen, which, queen of the sciences, which is theology. Luther, he says that reason is a, plays a ministerial role to revelation, right? That's all the pre-modern view. Here, you've got Descartes. Remember his times? 1596, 1650. What's Descartes famous for? What's his famous phrase? I, I think, I think, therefore I am. Notice the shift. Reason is elevated as the normative principle, I think, therefore I am. Um, here, remember, there's a God's eye point of view. 
there's a pre-formation theory. We've been formed in such a way as to know God and the world around us. Here, the moderns say, the mind is the mirror of nature. So we're not worried about a God's eye point of view. Now it's just the mind is the mirror of nature. So if you wanted a motto, look at what Locke said. This is really interesting. Locke says, I understand in order to believe. Do you notice the switch? If I understand it, okay, then I'll believe it. And so Locke engages, and he has a book on the evidence for Christianity, where he, we need to understand these things first, and then we'll believe it. Total shift. I think, therefore, I am. So what about, I think, therefore, God is? Would that be too modern? Or? Who said that? Oh. <laughs> uh, let's see, where would we put that? I think, therefore, God is? I'm not sure where you put that. Yeah. Um, Yeah, something like that. I think that's probably what Piper's getting at. Like the very, the very fact that you are here to even say something presupposes God's existence, or something like that. I, I would think that's where Piper's going with that. Yeah. But yeah, it's okay to you know. I like Piper. Um, yeah. Okay. One tangent. Maybe this will be the only one. What's interesting about the modern era, though? Um, this is an interesting example of you know when sometimes our actions have unintended consequences. So think about. Uh, the Reformation just happened right before we enter into the modern era. So, you know, Reformation, say Luther's 1517, the, the, the 95 theses on the door. Um, prior to the Reformation, what unified culture? The church, right. After the Reformation, uh, there's no sort of unifying, there's, there's nothing that unified uh, culture. There's no authority of the church. In fact, the Protestant Reformation end, ends up having splinterings of groups. And so what happens in the modern era is a new question arises. And the question is, what's going to give, what's going to unify culture, and what's going to be the source of authority in our culture? Because it's no longer the church. And you want to know what the answer is? Are you ready? Epistemology. Isn't that awesome? Uh, no, epistemology. Specifically, epistemological method. And so the question was, well, how can we know things now? Because no longer is the church that which is the source of authority for knowledge claims. And so what happens in the modern era, if you look at this, is there's a whole flourishing of books on epistemology or epistemological method. And so you have Descartes. Descartes was writing in like the 1640s. He wrote his uh, Meditations on First Philosophy and Method, method on Proper Discourse. You've got Locke, who wrote his um, Essay Concerning Human Understanding in 1689. You've got Hume, who wrote his Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding in 1748. So you've got just these flourishing of epistemological books um, and what happens, this is interesting, it ties to what we talked about with happiness on the problem of evil. What happens is two groups emerged, two sort of dominant groups. You had the so-called empiricist, or empiricism, and then you had the so-called rationalists, or those who argued for rationalism as our proper epistemological method of knowing things. What's interesting about that, so by the way, the empiricists were all the people on the British Islands, uh, or, or Scotland, or Wales, or whatever, they would be like John Locke, uh, Hume, uh, Berkeley. The rationalists were all the people on the continent, the French, uh, Germans, or Prussians, people like Kant, Spinoza, uh, Leibniz, um, Descartes. So what happens is uh, the rationalists had the be best, I think, answers, the, the best arguments, because the rationalists could account for a whole lot of, of knowledge that the empiricists couldn't. They, they could account for things like knowledge of other minds, or mathematical knowledge, or knowledge of moral values. Uh, or character or virtue. They could account for these things, but the empiricists couldn't. On the other hand, the empiricists, if you read their writings, they're fairly down to earth. Uh, like I'd mentioned, Hume writes with kind of a wit to him, and, um, and they, the empiricists were able, I think wrongly, but they were able to associate themselves with the rise of modern science. And so, for example, Locke, he was really influential on Newton. Newton's Mathematica Principia comes out uh, just a couple years later, 1704, and he's indebted to Locke's epistemology, which is empiricist. And so what happens is the rationalists had the better arguments, but they couldn't agree with each other, and they argued all the time with each other. The empiricists, on the other hand, had a fairly commonsensical approach. All knowledge comes from the five senses, and it was uh, wrongly associated with this rise of modern science. So who wins the day? The empiricists win the day in the modern era. As you come out of the modern era, the empiricists win the day. Remember how I told you, and so this just connects a little with, remember how we talked about happiness and how we had a change in epistemology that leads to a change in ethics? Well, it's all rooted, ultimately, in, in history, 
and the Reformation and, and the unintended consequences from that. Just interesting. I find those kinds of things interesting. But <laughs> All right, I'll stop. We should probably get back to our thing. Um, any questions on that? Sidebar. Interesting sidebar. Yeah. So I feel a little dumb, but I don't know what epistemology Oh, sorry. Empiricism? 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 Yeah. Okay. Epistemology, st- philosophical study of knowledge, just the study of knowledge. Empiricism is a, is a claim on how we know things that says we only know what comes from our five senses. Rationalism is another view of how we know things, and it just says um, we know things primarily through our rational intuitions. Sorry, thought I mentioned that, but I, I will keep, I should remind me to keep repeating. All right, so, oh yeah, back to subject, object dichotomy, postmodernism. Is our five minutes gone up? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Postmodernism, again, really interesting. Reason, dethroned. Same question, how do we as knowing subjects have knowledge about the objective world? So what's going to go in its place? Does anybody know? Uh, close. Self. Experience, self. Yeah, all those are close. Uh, it's society. Yep. Society. Now this is where it gets interesting. If you want the motto, this is from Derrida, French thinker. Reason has led us to a dead end. So remember, <laughs> reason is dethroned, and what's, pl- what's put in its place is society. And so you are a social construct. You and all of our meaning and our value and our, our morals and the, our identity is in fact a social construct. So, so what self is for you is, well, whatever your American context you know, makes you think you are. This is where it kind of gets weird though. Um, same subject object dichotomy, but now, Postmodernism says, remember that knowing subject? Well, as it turns out, there are no natures. There's no objective self, right? Because it's a social construct. So there's not a hundred human natures in this class. So we can kind of get rid of the knowing subjects anyhow. Oh, and by the way, remember that objective world? Well, either there really isn't any objective world out there, or if there is, you can certainly never know it. Why? Because language and culture stands in between whatever this is and whatever th- this is, and all of your biases stand in between them. So you just can't know it. So they reject reason. All realities are socially constructed. They reject an external world as a mind-independent reality. Uh, with respect to literature and the Bible, uh, there's no fixed meaning in any proposition or language itself. And that means uh, any piece of literature is whatever you want it to mean. And so the Bible is whatever, whatever it means for you. Whatever you want it to mean is what it means for you. And so now meaning for the individual reader equals what it means for the readers of one's own community and one's own language games. And of course you can see what kind of impact that has on hermeneutics, I would think. Yeah? Is that when Marx was able to take it to its extreme and say all society is a power struggle? Um, let's see. So Marx is before all this. Uh, so I would think it would be the other way around. I think the postmodern mindset would agree with Marx's statement. So all truth, capital or lowercase t, truth, is a result of the power struggle, usually of white males, you know, or something that have won the day. There's no capital T truth um, under postmodernism because it's a relativization of all these things. So I don't know. It's interesting. I think about that more, but I would be inclined to switch that around. Yes. Mm-hmm. That's right. Right. That's right. Yeah, it's unlivable. That will be one of the tests that we would want to apply. Yeah. Good. Okay. All right. So history of ideas in five or ten minutes or whatever. Um, let's. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Okay. Let's do this. I'm looking at my clock. It looks like I've got 22 minutes. <laughs>
and so I'm going to try and uh, say a little bit more of contrast between modernism and postmodernism for wi a bit. And then I'll try to assess it just briefly. And then I'll just, uh, and then I want to, I want to make sure I've got at least five minutes. I want to, I want to give you a story at the end and we want to watch a video as well. Um, so let's just do the best we can with what we've got. So what I want to do next is just contrast modernism and postmodernism on a few things. Again, just to help you understand uh, what it is that we're dealing with here. Okay, so let's see, modern era, postmodern era, and then we're just going to take a number of topics that you'll see on your screen and in your notes. So for example, truth. What is truth in the modern era? And in the modern era, truth would be things, you would use words like this. Truth is objective. Truth is discovered. Uh, truth is that which corresponds with reality. You know, these are the kinds of words, so the moderns were after truth. They wanted to discover it. You're not, you know, you're not, you're not creating it. But under the postmodern mood, you, you use words like this. Truth is relative. Truth is socially constructed. Uh, truth, truth dies. Uh, truth dies. Power, you know, fills the vacuum or something like that. It's tribal. It's community-based. So you can see a shift in the notion of truth here. There's no longer something we're discovering. We're just manufacturing it by our own community. Slightly confusing, I know. But that's okay. I just want to give you a flavor. We'll critique it in a minute. What's the dominant philosophy of the modern era? Well, what's interesting, motto, Latin for now, so modernism, just nowism. All that is, is what, you know, I was just, <laughs> I was at uh, Horsetooth on uh, Independence Day, and there's a guy that had a tattoo on his back, he had a shirt off, of course, swimming, and it said, all that is, is now. That's modernism, just nowism. <laughs> it was right there across his back, like, thanks, that was helpful. I didn't know that, now I know, it's from his tattoo. All that is, is now. <laughs> um, <laughs> That is an expression of modernism. <laughs> and so, uh, what's the dominant philosophy on postmodernism? Well, it's something called philosophical pluralism. If you're interested in more on this, read D.A. Carson's <laughs> massive book, 600 page, The Gagging of God. He talks about um, philosophical pluralism. What is philosophical pluralism? You ready? Philosophical pluralism is the view that any claim to be true is necessarily false. <laughs> Excellent. Milton noticed the main problem with that. That's self-refuting. Philosophical pluralism applied to religion, where, what's it lead to? Religious pluralism. So you can see the connections here. Religious pluralism, when did that come up? 1970s. John Hick. It's the postmodern mindset. You can locate that within the history of ideas now. It's, it's part of this cultural milieu that we have going on. Oh, here's an interesting one. We've mentioned this a bit. Tolerance. It used to be that you tolerate people and you disagree with ideas. Now you tolerate ideas because if you disagree with my ideas, you're disagreeing with me. And that's offensive. Because, remember, we're socially constructed. We are our ideas, and that's all who we are. So if you disagree with my ideas, you disagree with me, you're being intolerant. That's a huge shift in this notion of tolerance. And I mentioned Peter Crave. We ought to be a, uh, egalitarian with each other, but elitist with our ideas. I believe that is the true definition of tolerance. If you look in a dictionary, it'll say something like that. This came, this, um, talking about, you know, we talked about um, homosexuality last Friday with Spud, and um, I can remember, uh, this whole postmodern thing here, in terms of tolerance, really uh, came to the forefront for me. I was at Miami University on staff with Cruz a number of years ago. And the year before I'd gotten there on staff, we, we had done an outreach. And the title of the outreach was something like, you know, uh, come hear what life is like um, outside of the, you know, homosexuality from an ex-gay. You know, come hear from an ex-gay about what life is like outside of homosexuality. 
And so that was the year before I got there. The year that we were there, we were doing dining hall surveys, and I met this guy named Chris. And Chris was like diametrically different than me in so many ways. He, um, he was a... Uh, he was, I guess, of Catholic upbringing, but he was actually practicing Wiccan, which is like witch things. And uh, he was homosexual, or GLBTQ or whatever. Um, and he was, um, but he was actively so in the sense that he was politically active on that agenda as well. And so we were just really different people, but we um, you shared the gospel or the four laws first time we met, and we just struck up this friendship. And so we began to get together every week and for an hour and just talk over like, you know, here's something on the argument for God, and he'd give me something weird, and we'd just read it back and forth. <laughs> and, um, and so we became really good friends, and we would debate, and we would talk. But one day, he heard about that outreach that we had, that crew had done the year before. And so he was waiting for me that day. And so I walk into the dorm, this is Denison Hall in Miami, and we walked in, hey, what's up, Chris? And he just starts, like, cussing. He, you know, blah, 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 you having this, and all these things. And I was just sort of shocked, and it was all about this outreach. And, and then he walks, storms off. And I'm kind of stunned, and finally he comes back, and he apologizes, and we talk about it, and we have a good conversation. But what that was, was a really interesting example of the post, he was also into postmodern theory, that was his major, in the communications department. And what that was, was a perfect example. In, so ex-gay to him, was, it was like, you know, saying ex-Jew or something like that. It's just, it was part of who he was. And so to d disagree with the idea of homosexuality was to disagree with himself. And he, take, he took great offense at that. That was a very postmodern sort of approach to life. Uh, and it just came up, it was really, you know, just stark contrast. Now, um, we, we talked, we made up, he apologized, et cetera. But, but to me, that was a vivid example. I think we experienced that a lot. Um, things like that. You know, how dare you disagree with me? Well, since when? <laughs> Why can we not disagree and do so humbly, you know? All right. Epistemology, philosophical study of knowledge. Um, what is the epistemology of, <laughs> of the uh, modern era? Uh, the epistemology of the modern era is, well, you know, it's empiricism. That's the one that became dominant. This view that you can only know that which is of the five senses. Of course, note that rules out spiritual truth, rules out God, rules out moral values. Um, but what's interesting, what, to add there, uh, the other thing in terms of knowledge is there, it was a search for what's called meta-narratives. Another big word. But what is a meta-narrative? So the modern era was see seeking meta-narratives. And meta-narratives are overarching stories that explain all of reality. That's all a meta-narrative is. An overarching story that explains all of reality. So in the modern era, what you see are a flourishing of isms. Romanticism, humanism, atheism for the first time, well, in the modern garb becomes popular, agnosticism for the first time, uh, existentialism, all these isms, well, they're attempts to find meta narratives that explain all of reality. Is Christianity a meta narrative? Absolutely, yeah. Postmodernism, the epistemology that dominates is what's called skepticism. <clears throat> this is just the view that we that we can't know anything, that we're skeptical of knowledge claims. Uh, that's why I think, I mentioned that one of the great virtues of our day for the millennials and down is apathy. I think the other great virtue is doubt. You know, we think it's cool to doubt. Hey man, I'm not sure what to think about that. Well, you know, that has never been a virtue, except in the last 20 or 30 years, to just doubt everything, you know, to be cool. You know, like, as if that's like the wise thing. Ah, I don't know, I'll think about that. Um, that's a very postmodern, sort of mindset. The other thing to say is postmodernism is, uh, so there's this one French thinker called Leotard, but he said postmodernism post is incredulity towards meta narratives. In other words, they hate meta narratives. They don't like them. They think they're power plays by usually male white people to assert their own views of the world, you know, on reality or something like that. And so it's a return to what's called narrative, individual narratives. And so in the last 20 years, what you notice in the academy, and I've watched these things, is you notice a, a, re, a flourishing of new academic disciplines. So we have gay and lesbian studies, and feminist history, and um, you know, Afri uh, uh, American Indian studies, and all these new, new narratives that are cropping up in the academy. Why? Well, because there is no meta-narrative. All we have are individual stories. And so, so that's, what, that's, what, uh, that's an interesting shift as well that's taken place. Oh man, okay, two more. Religions, what were the religions that flourished 
uh, in the modern era, uh, they would be things like, uh, let's see, humanism, atheism, agnosticism, Uh, this, this phrase, agnosticism, was coined by uh, T.X. Huxley, who was a relative of Darwin, and he sort of coined the phrase, and it just means that we can't, we, you know, we can't say one way or the other whether God exists. Uh, under the postmodern era, well, what religions flourish? Uh, well, religious pluralism, like I said, we see that every day. Pluralism. I think New Ageism, sort of, although that's quieted down. Uh, the one that I see, I'll just coin the phrase, is, um, uh, what did I coin that? Oh, yeah, 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 Thera uh, therapeutic God, this therapeutic God-ism um, or something. But, you know, like I can remember, I was at a, uh, an outreach in Toronto a couple years ago, and it, it was like, the, the outreach, outreach was come grill the Christian, and I was the Christian, so it was like new to apologetics, so I was really scared. Um, and so we went in, and we were having this kind of open forum debate or discussion, and there's this guy in the back uh, at the end. He's like, look, you know, I refuse to believe in a God of wrath. I believe in a God of love and mercy, but I won't believe in a God of wrath. And it's kind of like as if our view of God is like 31 flavors. You know, you walk around, I'll have a little of this and a little of that. And he was engaging in this therapeutic God idea that we'll just worship whatever feels good for us or something like that. Um, <clears throat> there's a book by, uh, uh, his last name is Smith. I'm forgetting his first name, but... Um, He's at Notre Dame now. Christian Smith, he, uh, he wrote a book called Soul Searching, and in there he says that, uh, this is for teenagers, but he said that our teenagers basically worship a God that he termed moral, moralistic therapeutic deism. You know, that we, that we see God as somebody that we go to only when we need him, and that, that we see him as that we just need to live good lives otherwise. And so that's kind of the mindset that's really at home in postmodernism. Oh, man. Okay, last one. Objection to Christianity. This is just kind of interesting to see the shifts. I find this interesting, and it's all about me, so that's why we're doing this, but I hope it's helpful for you. <laughs> just joking. Objection to Christianity. Um, in the modern era, well, it was miracles can't happen. Remember Hume? Miracles can't happen, so Christianity is false. Remember modernism, just nowism? Remember empiricism? So that's the number one objection. Miracles can't happen, therefore Christianity is false. <clears throat> Under postmodernism, the objection is Christianity claims to be true, therefore it's false. <laughs> that's your number one objection. Why? Because of philosophical pluralism. You claim to be true. How arrogant. Of course, it's how intolerant to say there is the truth. Oh boy. Okay. Um, let me give you a brief critique and then let me tell you a story and we'll be done. Okay? And then maybe if you want, we can show a video if we can be like two minutes over. Um, all right. Critiques of postmodernism. I mean, there are some strengths for sure. You know, it, it makes it a helpful epistemological point. And what is that point? Uh, well, that we all approach lives from unique cognitive access points. You know, we each have our own experiences that we bring to the table. That's helpful. Sure. The problem is they take that and make a, they take that epistemological point and they add on another, a further metaphysical claim that therefore there is no objective reality. That, that's the part that's problematic. I say it's helpful. It has helpful critiques in places of modernity. Well, one place would be, um, you know, it, it's helpful in critiquing this Cartesian desire to have certainty in life. Well, yeah, we, there's really nowhere that we have complete certainty in anything. Well, that's a helpful critique, sure. By the way, you can get any of these things from Augustine. You don't need to go to postmodernism for it, but they're helpful nonetheless. Um, weaknesses, there's lots. Uh, those are all in your notes, aren't they? So that's not helpful. Um, misdiagnosis, man's fundamental problem. It says that our, our fundamental problem is, is meta narratives and, and power plays you know, put on by those who engage in these meta narratives. Well, that's not our fundamental problem, it's sin. Uh, it overstates the problem of language. So D.A. Carson wrote a 600-page book called The Gagging of God. So on postmodernism and those who embrace it that are emergence, um, even God can't communicate with us. So it's the gagging of God. Well, that's a little, that's a little too much. 
It's wrong thinking. It's, it's just wrong that relativism is true. If we had much more time, we could, I'd spend a whole section on that. Maybe we can try to get that later this week. Uh, and then, like Milton pointed out, you just can't consistently hold these things. It's unlivable. Let me show you a video, and with the story, we'll be done. Okay? Here's Bill, beardless Bill. Great. Now, I imagine some of you are thinking, but don't we live in a postmodern society in which these rational apologetic arguments and evidences are no longer effective? Since postmodernists deny the canons of traditional logic and rationality and truth, these apologetic arguments are worthless. Uh, all we can do is simply share our narrative in today's culture and invite people to participate in it. Well, in my opinion, this type of thinking could not be more mistaken. The idea that we live in a postmodern culture is a myth. The idea that we live in a postmodern culture is a myth which I think is perpetuated by youth ministers and seminarians. In fact, a postmodern culture is an impossibility. It would be utterly unlivable. Nobody is a postmodernist when it comes to reading the labels on a bottle of aspirin or a bottle of rat poison. If you got a headache, you better believe that texts have objective meaning. People are not relativistic when it comes to matters of engineering, science, and technology. Rather, as Sean so beautifully displayed for us, people are relativistic and pluralistic in matters of religion and ethics. But you see, that's not postmodernism. That's modernism. That's just old line verificationism and positivism, which says that if you can't verify it with your five senses, then it's just a matter of personal preference or emotive expression. We live in a cultural milieu which remains deeply modernist. In fact, I think that postmodernism is one of the craftiest deceptions that Satan has yet devised. Modernism is dead, he tells us. Don't worry about it. You don't need to fear it any longer. Forget about it. It's dead and buried. Meanwhile, modernism, pretending to be dead, comes back around in the fancy new dress of postmodernism, pretending to be a new challenger. Oh, your old arguments and evidences are no longer effective against this new opponent. You better simply get rid of them, lay them down. Instead, just share your narrative. And so Satan deceives us into voluntarily laying down our best weapons of logic and rationality and as a result ensuring modernism's triumph over us. If we follow this suicidal course of action, then the consequences for the church in the next generation will be catastrophic. Christianity will be reduced to just one more voice in a cacophony of competing voices, each sharing his narrative and none of them commending itself as the objective truth about reality while scientific naturalism continues to shape our view of how the world really is. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, really, really good. Let me, um, okay, just let me end with another story that will hopefully give some, uh, like I said, I wish we had more time on this. If you're interested, and I would have loved to take this to the postmodern turn that evangelicals have embraced in the last couple of years with the emergent church. If you're interested in that, you've got the structure notes, um, there's a talk on my website that I gave at CSU, uh, I think, uh, actually be either two or four years ago, called Understanding the, Th Understanding the Theology of the Emergent Church. If you go there, you get the same content that I would have shared for you here. And so it's actually, it's actually online. Just go to my webpage under Talks, Understanding the Theology of the Emergent Church. And so we'll just skip over that. I'm sorry that we don't have time. But let me, let me conclude with this. Um, you know, it's interesting. One of the applications that uh, I think is really helpful for us is that now more than ever we need to be the embodiment of truth uh, because we no longer live in this culture that engages in linear thinking and is able to sustain thought and so we need to just embody that and, and one of the ways that we do that is by telling our story and then not just telling our story but locating our story in God's story in the larger picture of God's story because of course Christianity is a meta narrative and if you wanted to summarize the four acts it would be something like creation the fall 
redemption, and restoration. These would be the four-act play that is the meta-narrative of Scripture. And so I've been thinking a lot about story over the last couple years and, and how to help our students and those whom we work with locate their lives within the great story of God. And I think that we need to be good, we need to be better storytellers. And so here's something that I want to give you. It's another subtext of this course. I'm just going to tell you. Um, and it has to do with the point of story because we are all engaged in a story. And our job is to locate our lives in the great story of God. So I want to share with you as we end um, what J.R. Tolkien says about story. And I think this is absolutely brilliant. And it's going to reveal to you one of the main subtexts for what we're doing here this week. Um, Lewis, I'm sorry, Tolkien, in um, a really hard to read essay, but it's worth your time. It's called, it's, it's his um, essay on fairy stories. You can find it in the Tolkien Reader. I think you can find it online as well. It's called his essay on fairy stories. But in there, uh, Tolkien makes three points about the point of story. And the first thing that, um, that Tolkien says about story is he's, he makes a distinction between what he calls primary belief and secondary belief. And uh, he says that when you read good fiction, uh, when you go to a movie and you enter into the story of that, that, you know, that movie that you're walking, watching, uh, it's done so well, and the story is developed so masterfully that you actually enter, it, enter into it, and it commands what he calls secondary belief. So, for example, when the hero saves the day, you, you sigh with relief. And when the couple gets together and, you know, they finally, finally are able to fall in love, you, you, you know, you express and experience joy. And, and you've entered into that story. And so uh, you suspend belief, Tolkien says, in the primary world so that you can enter into the world, the, you know, the secondary world of the fictional story. So he calls that secondary belief. That's the first thing he says. The second thing Tolkien says in this essay on fairy stories is he argues that human beings long for a certain kind of story. And he says that we all long for the same kind of story and it has five characteristics. He says we all long, and in fact, we long for fairy stories. And the five characteristics of a fairy story would be this. We long for a world that depicts a supernatural reality. That's the first thing. We long for a world where death is cheated, where there's a way to escape death. He says, third, we long for a world where love is eternal. That is, love is unending. Fourth, uh, we long for a story that where victory is snatched from the hands of defeat. And fifth, where there's a happy ending. This is the kind of story that we long for. And then Tolkien talks about how modern intelligentsia just doesn't, it doesn't like those kinds of stories. Yet we still all long for them, right? And then third, Tolkien asks the question. He says, why do we all feel this way? Why do we all long for that kind of story? Because at the fact level, we know that life is temporally bound. We know that often evil does triumph. And we know that love is, you know, sometimes imperfect. Uh, and of course, we're told by the modern world that there is no supernatural. And so Tolkien answers his own question. Why do we long for this kind of story? And this is what he says. He says that fairy stories, he believed, actually point to an underlying reality that is more real than the primary world. And that's why we long for these kinds of stories. And, he, and, and what, what I love, by the way, about what Tolkien and Lewis are doing, do you know why they write about Middle Earth? Do you know why they created Narnia? Well, they wrote these stories because they wanted to awaken within you a desire. They wanted to awaken within you a desire for another world. And that's why we want to go back to Middle Earth all the time. You know, that's why these movies are like four and a half hours each. We just want, we don't want to leave Middle Earth, right? And this is why we want to continue to go back to Narnia. So what are they doing in this? They're awakening within us a desire for another world so that we will awaken that desire to enter the only other world that we can ever enter, which is the kingdom of God. And so they're brilliant in writing their fantasy and their fairy story. But here's what Tolkien says. He says... The underlying reality that we all long for, he says it's the gospel itself. This is a brilliant turn in this essay. He says that in the gospel, you get everything that you want. You get a story of God's re rescue mission. You get a heroic sacrifice. You get victory snatched out of the hands of defeat. You get unending love. You get a supernatural reality. And you get a happy ending. He says you get it all. But then... And this gets to my subtext. Then what, what Tolkien says is he begins to think about the gospel itself. And he says the gospel isn't one more underlying story in which, to which all good stories point. He says in the gospel you get the point of all story. And what is the point of all story? It's Jesus. And he says that's the point of all good stories. This is what we all long for. Jesus is the point of all good stories. And what we find in the gospel then is actually God puncturing a hole between what is the case 
and what ought to be the case. Uh, and of course, the resurrection means that Jesus isn't one more beautiful story uh, or one more you know, good action film that when we walk out of the movie theater and when we put the book down, we enter the primary world. But the gospel is the story um, itself. It's a story in which all good stories point, and it breaks into our world and introduces a joy that is greater and more complete than any fairy story. And so when we think about postmodernism, when we think about engaging a culture that is lost in confusion and clarity uh, and, and into existentially bankrupt, well, we can share our stories, yes, but we can connect them with the point of all good stories, which is Christ. And so I would just encourage you, and this is the subtext, this is a major subtext for everything that I do, is that when we tell our stories, that what we are doing is we are pointing to the underlying reality that we all long for, and, that is, and the point of story, which is Christ. And so helping others to locate their lives in the great story of God, I think that is one of the strongest apologetics that we can have uh, in the face of this confusion um, that, w- that our culture finds ourselves in. So I leave that with you. Uh, let me pray. Sorry, I went a little over, and uh, have a good day. Let's pray. Jesus, uh, thank you that you are the point of all, all story, and that, Lord, we do long for these things, this world. Uh, we long for a uh, happy ending and for love that's eternal and death to be cheated. And, Lord, thank you that um, there is a true story, that there is a true meta narrative. And Lord, I pray that we would locate our lives in that great story. And Lord, as we do that, that the world would see the embodiment of a faithful life lived for you. And Lord, ultimately, perhaps the best apologetic for Christianity is a life well lived under the banner of Christ. And so Lord, I pray that it would be true of our lives and be true of mine. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.